In the early 4th century, there was a North African pastor named Arius. And he began to teach that Jesus was not on the same level of divinity as God the Father. He even used Bible passages to back up his claim, quoting the very words of Jesus himself from 1 John chapter uh, 14, where Jesus said, the Father is greater than I. Seems pretty clear, right? He had another passage from Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He said, Jesus is the firstborn over all creation implying that Jesus was the very first thing that God created. Arius went on to reason that, well, even the very title of Jesus as the only begotten, uh, it suggests just logically that there was a time before he was born. I mean, an earthly father and the baby cannot be at the same time, you know? And so there was a time that the father was that the son was not. Well, those were fighting words back then. And it got so contentious, so heated in the debate between Arius and the other Christians that at one point he was punched in the mouth. Well, that got the attention of the authorities all the way up to the top. The emperor himself, Constantine, he wanted his favorite new religion of Christianity to all get along with each other and so he exiled Arius, and then the, the creed was written, the Nicene Creed, which spells out very clearly once and for all that Jesus, why he is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, which all means he's of the same substance. He's the same stuff as the Father. Begotten, not made. Okay, we got that settled now. And, and yeah, then now certainly... We need to answer what Arius had to say. And yeah, Jesus, while he walked this earth, humbled himself for a time as he suffered and as he died on the cross. But, you know, Philippians chapter 2 kind of lays out how that all worked, how Jesus was still equal with the Father and yet humbles himself, uh, humbled himself uh, to be a servant. He's of... He's of the same as the Father, in the same nature. And at the same time, being one with the Father. And that's how John begins his, um, his gospel. When John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh, and we have beheld His glory. That's talking about Jesus. And... It's not just the Father and the Son have been together forever, but also the Spirit. This holy community, holy family, have always been co-eternal, co-equal, co-all of those things. And, but of course, a, a punch in the face and an exile of Arius did not uh, once and for all solve everything. People began to wonder out loud and and even question openly, well, wait a minute, if God is three persons, then how do you not end up with three gods? You know, how could there just be three persons and one God? And it, it, they have to be three, and then, like, somebody has to be, like, the God, you know, so it's like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So another creed had to be written. That's right, and it kind of spells out this mystery of the Trinity. We don't have three gods. We have one God, and, and this this uh, creed, it begins with a bit of a punch in the face, too, and a threat of exile. I'm talking about the Athanasian Creed. We wheel this one out like once a year on this Sunday. It begins this way by saying, Whosoever shall be saved uh, before all things, it's necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt, shall perish ever. You get the point? Okay. And then it goes on for 40-some lines. The Father's this, the Son is this, the Holy Spirit is this, they're all this and that, and it lays out in great detail, almost like a computer program, and then it ends this way. This is the Catholic faith, which except a man believe truly and firmly cannot be saved. 
We're talking big time exile here for anyone who won't subscribe. And that's kind of the classic um, shortcut that we like to take with all of the creeds. You know, that, that once you've stated it, you know, once you've studied it, and this is what I believe, and you boldly say it in front of everyone, it's like you can know with confidence you're right, and anyone who disagrees is so wrong. You know, and that's, that's what we do on Trinity Sunday. You know, we wheel this one out and let everyone know. And, and of course, you know, that I'm tongue-in-cheek here because it's, it's not... Being right can so easily become the end point and destination of any Christian. You know, it's just as long as we're, we're right. And rather than using the creeds as a vehicle and a means to speak accurately and faithfully and truly and precisely of who this God is who has redeemed us, loves us, leads us in a life in which we are becoming transformed on the inside to have a heart very much like His own of peace, gentleness, self-control. If you're punching your opponent in the face, labeling them, having all kinds of contempt in your heart against another human being, that too is a creed that speaks very loudly about the kind of God that you would follow. Paul reminds us that, you know, knowledge builds and puffs up. Being right, you know, puffs you up. But love builds up. And he, he felt so strongly about it. He wrote a whole chapter of the Bible, right? He goes on and on to say, hey, it doesn't matter how accurate and clear and concise you are about your faith. It doesn't matter if you're willing and you've got a faith to, to sacrifice everything to the flames or, or move a mountain. It just doesn't matter. If you don't love the person sitting right next to you in your own church, you're a clanging gong. You're a resounding cymbal. Besides, no opponent who's ever been exiled or thought down or put down has ever truly been converted in their heart. That's not how God works. He doesn't subdue into submission. He woos with His love and grace in Christ. Well, I kind of learned that myself this past several weeks as I've been meeting with Mormon missionaries. I know. In the past, I've never given them any of my time because arrogantly, I've just assumed I'm right. They're wrong. I'm not changing. They're not changing. So what's the point of having a conversation in the first place? And that's pretty much how I've lived my life. About three weeks ago, a couple of Mormon missionaries were walking through the neighborhood over here at Maple Valley, and I was on a walk, and they're like, hey, and I'm like, oh, hi. And, and then I was really struck that the, the age of these men, they, they were young men, they're college age. And I have college age students, and my heart just went out to them. My kids are their age. And I thought to myself, if these were my children, I would hope and pray that somebody would care about them and love them, to listen to them, and then share Jesus with them. So, schedule an appointment with them. Let's get together. No, not at my house. Let's get together at McDonald's on, on Tyler Road. And so we've met now a total of three times, and I've begun each time kind of the same way. So I, all right, you've got a willing listener here. You tell me whatever it is you have come to tell me. All right, and I was kind of surprised that they didn't have like a canned prep, you know, speech. You know, here, here's their presentation. But rather, they began with a question. They said, well, what do you believe about God? <laughs> You're asking me about my creed? Oh, I'm all over this. So I, I told them, well, I'm a Jesus follower, and that means that I'm his apprentice. He's the master teacher. He's my, my savior. He's my friend. He's my God. My Lord, I follow Him, and, and I'm in this daily interactive relationship with Him in which I'm learning from Him how to live life right now 
as his very own. And he's transforming my heart into a new kind of heart to be like his own. So I get through this long, you know, my faith story, my creed, you know, and, and they just look at me and they go, we believe the same thing. And it's like, really? Jesus died, his, his blood shed, forgives all your sins, the Father, Son. Yep, we believe all of that. And so I asked them, well, then why are you knocking on my door? You know what? Why have you come? And then it came. They pull out their Book of Mormon. I have a book for you. Have you ever read the Book of Mormon, they asked me. Now, I, I have tried in the past. It's, it's over 500 pages. It's, it's in Old English. It's, it's a hard read, okay? I just, it's been a while, but I was like, I, I can't do this. And, and then, but I asked them, how, how did you come to such a conviction that this Book of Mormon is a true and accurate testament of Jesus Christ? And they kind of wait for that question. I mean, this is like Mormonism 101. This is the question you, you hope will be asked because you've got this answer. And this is the answer they give. It's a process in which you read the Book of Mormon and then you pray to the Holy Spirit and you ask the Holy Spirit, is this true? And then the Holy Spirit works in your heart some kind of testament, a witness, a feeling, an emotion, a yes! And then you know it's true. Well, what broke my heart is that one of these young men, four years ago, was in our, not our congregation, but in, was a Lutheran. And I asked him, how, how did you go from that to this? And he said, it was this book and that question. The Holy Spirit has convinced me that it's true. And so that was their challenge to me. Will you take this book home? Will you read this? Will you pray to the Holy Spirit? Now, I've been meeting with them for a while. And we kind of like, well, where else, where's this relationship going to go? And so I reluctantly agreed that I would read this and I would pray. <sighs> but I'll tell you that I was not able to read very much of this book. Even having it in my head hands. There was a keen sense and awareness of a very dark presence behind this book. That there is a lying spirit waiting for the reader of this book. Now I want to be very clear that the Mormons are not out to deceive you. They really believe that the Holy Spirit has convinced them this is true. They're just out there telling you about it. These young men, I have grown to care about them deeply. But there is a lying spirit waiting for the reader. And as I just, I just couldn't even touch it or, or read it any longer, it really left a question in my soul. Well, how do I know how am I so convinced in what I believe is accurate and true? How do I know and how could I know if a lying spirit had so deceived me into believing what I believe? Those are pretty serious questions. Of course, we have the creeds, right? You know, creeds are very helpful. They, they, they lay it all out for you. But you know what? Those Mormon missionaries, they believed the same thing. They called God Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They would say the same thing about this creed that I would say. So the creeds, it really kind of shows its weakness because you can have a title like God the Father. I mean one thing by it, and they mean something different. I say Jesus, and they have a different Jesus. So creeds are, they're just not enough. So you go back to the original source, right, to the Bible itself. I think, yeah, original source. They read the Bible probably more than most. They read it daily, and they believe it. And so I was just kind of dumbfounded. Like, how can you be reading this and come to that conclusion, and I be reading it and come to this conclusion? And it really bothered my soul. And I was, I was in the sanctuary of the Tyler campus. And just praying to God and really wrestling with this. God, what's going on? And these words 
of Jesus came to my mind. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow. See, when I read the Scriptures, when I confess the Creed, there is a spiritual presence behind it all. There is a voice behind it all. And it is the Good Shepherd Himself. It is Jesus. There is a very different voice behind the Book of Mormon. And it colors how they read the Scriptures. And so, I really was so taken by what these words came to my mind. I thought it so important that you hear them too. From John chapter 10. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what He was telling them. But this is what He had said. He said, I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in from some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. He leads them out. When he has brought them all out, all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. How can we know the words of Scripture are true? How can we know our creed is correct? How can we know that the Book of Mormon has a lying spirit behind it? How can we know that absolutely every other religion, no matter how peaceful, how wonderful, no matter how beautiful the people who adhere to it and follow it, is wrong except the Jesus followers? How can we know that? Because of the shepherd's voice. The sheep will not follow another. They run away from the other. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. And what kind of shepherd is this? This shepherd is the kind who lays down his life for the sheep. This is the shepherd who, when punched in the face, does not punch back. He does not put down his adversaries. He does not exile anyone. But he is actively pursuing those who are his enemies. He is forgiving his enemies. And then he gathers his sheep together and he says, I send you out into the entire world so that more people will hear the Good Shepherd's voice. So the sermon take home today isn't a card, it's a challenge to engage in a very loving and respectful way the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, your atheistic friends and neighbors, and relatives, anybody who's listening to another voice. To engage them in such a way that you become a creed of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That your kindness and your gentleness and your self-control are evident to all. That's not just the challenge of your pastor Scott. That's Jesus, right? I mean, he sent us out for this. And he says, I, I'm always with you. The shepherd is leading us. Let us follow the shepherd. Amen.